The Total War series has a very long history in 2021. Having gone from exclusively publishing historical titles to diving deep into popular fantasy, Total War games have never been as diverse nor as many as they are today. But how did this series, developed by Creative Assembly, get to where it is now? And what makes Total War so special? That's what we'll find out in this video. And if that sounds like something you'll be interested in, I hope you leave a like and a comment down below. And now, Total War. If you're not that familiar with Total War, then don't worry. The main concept really isn't that hard to grasp. In essence, most games in this genre offers a campaign map where you assume direction of a nation or culture, often called a faction. Your job is to develop this faction in all aspects of society and government, and often ultimately leading your faction in wars of conquest. In most strategy games, the campaign map is all you get, with massive wars often only being symbolized by somewhat large cartoonish models on the map basically running around hitting each other. The main thing about Total War then, which was, and frankly remains so exciting, is the fact that it is by and large the only strategy game series which has perfected the art of a dual system, of a campaign map with strategic maneuvers, politics, diplomacy, and societal development taking place in a turn-based system, and a real-time battle simulation where grand armies are controlled by the player. This means that instead of this, you get this. And if I got to pick, I'd happily choose the latter form of virtual warfare any day. This is Total War's biggest selling point. And somehow, for some reason, even when proving that this formula is hugely popular and cinematic, Total War remains the only, and I mean the only series to really offer cinematic battles on this scale. Of course, Total War didn't always look this good. Getting here took a long time, and I'll show you exactly how we got to the point where we are today. Our tale begins in the ancient era. The year is 2000, and the first Total War game releases in June. Ah, the summer of June 2000. Perhaps, perhaps, my friends, the happiest summer ever made. Ever made? What? It's an era before 2001, an era before 2008, an era even after 1989. The year 2000 was a vibe. And of course, this was the June that would give us Shogun Total War. And yes, back in the day, the name of the game appeared before the words Total War, which in my opinion sounds a lot better, but I suppose it makes less sense marketing-wise, gosh darn it. This first Total War took place in feudal Japan. Here, warring samurai clans fought each other over the power of the shogunate, in an era where the influence of Christianity became present. As a first of its kind, Shogun offered massive 3D battles where you lead your armies as a proper general, leading hundreds or even thousands of troops on the screen at the same time. Compared to other RTS games, that's real-time strategy for the adorable uninitiated, Total War was so much more ambitious, so much more realistic, yet infinitely more cinematic at the same time. The man in charge was Mike Simpson, and it might sound weird to you when I tell you that the battle maps were actually the thing the team at Creative Assembly implemented first. That's right, there was never actually going to be a campaign map. But luckily, Simpson got the idea that a campaign map would give the player something to care about, be it the faction's administration, overall war goals, and the general sense and responsibility of leading a nation rather than leading random armies. This is how we get the classic turn-based campaign map where you administer your faction, while simultaneously fought battles in real time. But contrary to many other games, this map was actually based on real-life Japan, not some randomized map version of it. This meant that the Total War games truly meant to focus on historical and geographical accuracy, rather than the more abstracted or localized civilization maps, for example. And I, for one, am very grateful for this decision. So why Japan? Well, this time period was chosen because the setting and conflict had the potential to offer diversity. Not only did the Sengoku period include both samurai warriors and the introduction of gunpowder, but traditional Japanese religion and a rise in Christian influence and a conflict with almost equally matched rival clans. This game sold over 200,000 copies, making it a big success which in turn prompted an expansion pack focusing on the Mongol invasion of Japan. 
the Shogun Total War turned out to be quite the revolution in strategy gaming then. But Total War hadn't quite picked up its mass audience just yet. It only took one year and two months before the next major title in the series released. God, I miss gaming in the early 2000s. This time, our focus turned to Europe. And more precisely, the all-powerful, beloved by all, medieval time period. This is when we get Medieval Total War. The original, that is. Medieval expanded the map and then some, giving us an example of the iconic European, North African and Middle Eastern settings, which would come to completely dominate the Total War games which came after. Medieval takes place from 1087 to 1453, meaning that we begin roughly with the conquest of England by the Normans and end with the fall of Constantinople by the Ottomans. This time period is now a classic video game time span in strategy games if there ever were one. As you might be able to see, Medieval used the same engine as Shogun did. So despite the graphics staying the same, some things definitely changed. Apart from the enormous map, characters and generals became more fleshed out, giving them traits meant to foster personalities. In addition, the game offered more factions spanning the entire map, and players were finally introduced to siege battles, which have become a staple and major selling point of the franchise. In addition, the battle maps were now meant to mimic the campaign map, meaning that if you initiated a battle on a bridge, that bridge was meant to show up in the actual battle as well. The troop limit was also increased to 10,000 per battle, proving once again that Total War was a completely different beast compared to other games in the wider genre. Medieval was the last Total War to offer this paper-like campaign map. But I have to say, despite the graphics, it kinda slaps. Like with Shogun, Medieval received an expansion pack named Viking Invasion, focusing on, well, the Viking invasion of the British Isles during the Viking Age. Jeez, that's a lot of Viking. Having now proved themselves as a confident and capable developer, Medieval Total War went on to sell 1.5 million copies according to GameSpot, a massive step up from Japan-based Shogun. And then, we have the real turning point. Not only for Total War, but for strategy gaming in general. I hate goals. My grandfather hated them too, even before they put out his eyes. In 2004, two whole years after Medieval this time, Rome Total War changed everything for the series. The setting was pushed back farther than ever, beginning around the time of the First Punic War in 270 BC and ending at the historical end of Emperor Augustus' reign in 14 AD. I don't think I have to say that much before it becomes evident just how much has changed here. The entire game has gone from looking flat and using 2D sprites to using full 3D models, making the entire world just look so much more alive. I said the map of Medieval looked timeless, but even now, Rome still manages to hold up extremely well, and I would be surprised if this turned out to be the first Total War game to be remastered. I mean, it just looks so good, you know? Anyway. Just like last time, Rome takes place on virtually the same map, only now looking like actual geography and terrain. Everything is green and lush and yellow, brown and sandy where it's supposed to be, with snowy mountains and lush forests. On the battle map as well, soldiers look lifelike in comparison to the old visuals, and the same goes for the city models. Rome was a true leap in graphics over medieval, and most likely the largest jump in visual fidelity Total War has ever and will ever make. But more was done underneath the hood as well. The campaign map includes many different and diverse factions, from Rome to Carthage and the Gauls to the Seleucid Empire, offering some memorable, beautiful music and realistic sounds. Rome also gave us missions which we could complete for rewards, units could be upgraded, diplomacy was fleshed out with expanded options, and for Rome itself, a minigame centered around the Senate was introduced meaning that you would eventually have to wage war on the other Roman factions if you ever wanted to completely dominate the world. And characters, even though there was no real skill tree, evolved and attained abilities and retinue space on how you use them. Rome Total War became my introduction to the series, and I remember seeing the game's trailer just fawning over the possibilities of massive battles in a historical strategy game. Rome set the new standard for what could be achieved in Total War games, going so far as showing up on game shows on national TV in the UK, outselling every previous title in the franchise. And again, the music remains absolutely legendary. 
and we mustn't forget the general speeches, which added so much immersion to the battles as the generals actually spoke based on their situation, placement and enemy. We outnumber them by a small margin. From such small beginnings are great victories crafted. That said, their skills and training are formidable. More than force will be needed today. Rome, being hugely popular, received two expansions. The first one, and frankly, the best, was the Barbarian Invasion expansion, which let us play as either the Western or the Eastern Roman Empire in a much more dangerous time. When the Empire faced collapse in the face of invading Barbarians, Huns or Sassanids, all of which you could play too, by the way. Then, the Alexander expansion let us control Alexander on his way into the Persian Empire, which is a cool premise, but sadly, we were given this sorry excuse of a map to do it on. Malacca. Rome proved that the Total War formula could work and indeed thrive in a 3D animated space, even more so than in its previous entries. And this would only become more true with the next major title in the series, arriving two years later. Medieval 2 Total War. Medieval 2. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Maybe it's just because I've played it so gosh darn much, but the words medieval hold a very special place in my heart. And evidently, it does so for many of you as well, seeing as it is one of the highest rated and most popular Total War games ever made. Medieval 2 takes us back to the High and Late Middle Ages, once again thrusting us into the European, North African, and Middle Eastern scene as factions like England, France, the Holy Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, Egypt, the Moops, and Denmark. Uh, Denmark. To be finding me beautiful is not uncommon. The new campaign map looks a bit more medievalish than the one in Rome, but retains roughly the same size. But what's different is that the game introduces resources and the merchant agent, which lets us compete over a vast amount of resources actually present on the map. Medieval 2 had two types of settlements instead of just one, adding the castle as well. This castle served as a war machine compared to the economic powerhouse of the city, and you'd do well to play the strengths of each settlement type. In addition, we now had many more fateful events occurring. The Crusader and Jihad mechanic pit the Christians and Muslims against one another, and events like the Mongol and Timurid invasions, the Black Death, the invention of gunpowder, and even the discovery of America made for a game with massive changes even in the late game. This kept Medieval 2 forever fresh, and it was so fun to plan ahead even in the early stages of the game in order to fully prepare for the challenges to come. On the battlefield, Medieval 2 also added a few things. For one, you could now capture fleeing soldiers which you could in turn decide to either ransom, set free, or execute post-battle. It did sound pretty bad though. No, please, my lord, reconsider! God be praised for this victoire! The soldiers now even fought more organically and somehow managed to offer cool fighting moves while still retaining a good sense of unit collision, making for truly organic battles. Let's not also forget that the look of each unit now often differed from one another, which made the armies look like actual armies rather than the Clone Wars armies of Rome. Moreover, and this is by far the coolest thing ever to be added, which I'm so sad has never been truly done again if I'm not mistaken, is the fact that the armor of the soldiers on the battlefield were given visual upgrades as you upgraded them on the campaign map. This was just an amazingly immersive and visual move, and needs to be brought back in the series right meow. We even had some nice and just charming video clips which would play during events, like through agent actions, royal weddings, or indeed crusades. I swear I know this old monk's monologue by heart. The Holy Bible may preach peace, but when it is Christendom itself that is threatened, then it is every Christian's duty to defend all that is holy. This is how you make a game come alive. And sadly, we have yet to see such attention to detail in all aspects implemented in a Total War game since. Just listen to this absolutely bonkers general speech, which has to be the best implementation of the Total War general speech ever. Saint Denis preserve us. 
I have seldom seen a more dispiriting sight than the English army. They have no sense of style, no elan, no manly virtues, no reason to live, no decent food, no attractive women folk. And their leaders, oh why, the devil himself would be shamed to have them in hell. And so to battle. Get the tedious business done, and then hey-ho to the wine! I am a proud Frenchman, and I know what is important! In other words then, Medieval 2 was an absolutely fantastic game, heightened by its jump in graphics over Rome and the continuation of a soundtrack which just never quit. It even got an expansion pack the size of some full games, giving us a total of 4 campaigns in one game. This was the Kingdoms expansion, and gave us the Americas campaign taking place during the conquest of the Americas, the Teutonic campaign depicting the Crusades in the Baltic region, the Crusades campaign which depicted the OG Crusades in the Holy Land and the Levant, making for an epic showdown between two fates, and the Britannia campaign, letting us once again wage war over England, even going so far as allowing us to play as Norway, and not Denmark. <laughs> but the coolest and I mean the coolest thing about the Kingdom's expansion, was the implementation of the Hot Seat mechanic. Because of this, Hot Seat is another special word to me. Medieval 2 is in fact the best Total War game in history in my opinion, largely because of this Hot Seat mechanic, allowing me, my brother and our friends to play together for thousands of hours over several years. It's amazing what the Hot Seat mechanic did, and because Medieval 2 was such a blessing for modders, allowing for the creation of the all-time best Total War mods in the world, we could play all of them together. Medieval 2 remains legendary to this day, and is in my opinion the last of the classic Total Wars, and you'll soon find out exactly why that is. This is a time of faith, a time of battle, a time of Total War. In 2009, Total War made its return with Empire Total War, a massively ambitious game which aimed at making much of the world our playground. Not only was Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East involved, but North America and even India were included as fully playable regions at the same time as the rest, even including trade regions where your faction could sail to seek riches. Empire takes place during the age of new imperialism and colonization, of rising and decadent empires, and since naval warfare was such a big part of this era, Empire became the first game in the series to introduce this as well, bringing with it some stunning visuals and sounds. But it didn't stop there. Empire was the Total War game to introduce a dedicated technology tree rather than having you progress through buildings and upgraded city tiers alone, and the battlefields moved on from swords and shields to rifles and cannons, changing the entire flow of gameplay, and not only for the better. This brings us back to Medieval 2 being the last of the classics, because Empire's new Warscape engine, among other design choices, really did change the game's main mechanics a lot. In battles, Creative Assembly had focused on making one-on-one -on -one combat look cinematic, but this didn't really work out as intended, with fights often looking weird or units matching each other while others just stood and waited for their turn. Yeah, this looks not okay. <laughs> the battles did look awesome though, for the most part, but I just couldn't shake the feeling that a unit of 160 firing riflemen ought to be able to unalive more than three people in an entire volley at the same time. The siege battles were also just a mess, with the AI often refusing to attack you outright, forcing you to quit the game if you didn't have the foresight to put on a battle time limit. The flag carrying lieutenants were awesome though, but it was a big letdown that the general speeches were now gone. On the campaign map, some things were even worse. Cities now came with a limited number of building slots which only allowed you to have a handful of buildings in each city, severely limiting the player's role-playing and gameplay options. This kind of sucked big time, I have to say. In addition, the map, even though large in scope, was narrow in design, having massive countries like France and Spain being made up of only one gosh darn city. Norway was also just one city, but luckily, so were Denmark and Sweden. On the bright side of city building, we retained at this stage a population number, 
We still had religion be a thing, and the game introduced smaller towns which in a way served as parts of the province, but which were in a way specialized districts catering to aspects of the economy or the war machine, like farms or factories. In addition, the AI was simply atrocious and never really made sense no matter how much you tried to make it work, even on the campaign map. More than that, Empire majorly changed the way diplomacy worked, and in my opinion, not for the better. Because before Empire, you would actually have to physically send emissaries and diplomats to other factions in order to speak to them. Magnificent! You have made us very happy these days. Now though, every faction was gathered in a menu, being able to be reached at all times, even during late at night. This streamlining and simplification is something CA chose to implement in every single other Total War game after, whether it made sense historically or not to be able to magically call upon a foreign people far away out of nowhere. But perhaps the worst part of Empire, perhaps the absolutely most egregious aspect, was the complete and utter move away from a universal modding capability. Where Rome and Medieval 2 gave us mods which allowed us to completely overhaul the game into virtually whatever we wanted, Empire did no such thing. At best, Empire allowed for the changing of background numbers and values, of flags and unit textures, and of music and certain code. And because of this, Empire had no actual total conversion mods in the same sense as the previous games, and was all the more of a disappointment for it. This actually spelled doom for my favorite website at the time, the Total War Center, which I must have spent thousands of hours on, checking all the awesome mods for Medieval 2 and Rome. Empire didn't even include my cherished hot seat mode, which absolutely crushed me after I found out on release date after having brought the game home, sat down ready to play England vs France with my brother, and had the candy ready and everything. The game threw away prisoners of war, agent movies and other videos, visual upgrades of units, game changing events, and other aspects of that nature. Empire was indeed a hugely ambitious project and remains an overall good game but nevertheless ended up an empire-sized letdown for many fans, myself included. My enemies are many. My equals are none. Some of the criticism of Empire was addressed in the next game, Napoleon Total War, which released in 2010, back when people still said 2000 and. Napoleon was in many ways a favorite of mine, it included virtually all of Empire's best mechanics, but improved upon the graphics, the music, the performance, and indeed, the overall quality and presentation. And again, this intro is just so freaking legendary, I decided to showcase it in my high school French class in a presentation on Napoleon. And I trust you would do the same, my dear viewer, if not in practice, then at least in spirit. In the land of pharaohs and kings, they said Egypt could never be humbled. In the realm of forest and snow, they said Russia could never be tamed. Now they say nothing. Napoleon Total War has a much narrower scope than Empire, moving away from the globe-spanning map to focusing exclusively on Europe and the Coalition Wars. It's a small but focused game, offering a few different Napoleonic campaigns like the one in Italy, Egypt, later on in Spain, and the main European theater. To this day though, I don't understand why they just couldn't find it in themselves to add North Africa and the Middle East, at least Egypt, Syria, Palestine and Turkey, to this campaign map. Like, it's right there guys, come on! Napoleon is perhaps one of the smaller Total War games, and the one that changed the least from its predecessor, but in many ways it served as a standalone expansion, a game closely tied to its predecessor without being an actual add-on to it. That being said, I love Napoleon. The updated visuals added much more flavor to the battles, and even on the campaign map, haze and snow effects added a lot of immersion. Generals had a lot more personality now, seeing as they were actual historical people rather than randomized characters, and the fact that we could either play as Napoleon or take him down as one of the traitorous, cowardly, bourgeoisie coalition members was awesome. 
and I liked how the game dealt with time, making each turn last a few weeks rather than years. But in my opinion, it suffers from many of the same dumbed down and removed mechanics syndrome as Empire. What was cool though, was that Napoleon was the first Total War game to fully implement an online multiplayer campaign, even though it could only be played between two players. The reign of the old Shogunate is over. The next Total War game released only a year later, in 2011, but it would become one of the community's most acclaimed and beloved titles ever. Shogun 2 returned the series to its roots, once again pitting warring Japanese clans against one another. Japan had now gone from looking like this to looking like this, offering one of the most beautiful, massive and stylistic maps in the series history. Shogun 2 vastly improved upon the combat system from Empire, to a large extent bringing back good unit collision, improving on the matched combat so that battles looked cinematic instead of messed up, and made generals actually important again, having you level them up in the first ever real Total War character skill tree. Videos for agent actions made a grand and welcome return, and so did night battles. Shogun 2 even had a special late game mechanic called Realm Divide, which basically pitted the entirety of Japan against you should you become powerful enough to march on Kyoto to claim the capital. What's more is that general speeches made a return, but not as charismatic or funny as they once were. Shogun 2 is perhaps THE modern game in the Total War series to more than any other implement rock, paper and scissor styles tactics to its battles, having very clear advantage and disadvantages between its units, even though this obviously also matters to the other games. About half a year later, the expansion Rise of the Samurai released, moving the start date back about 400 years to the Genpei War, long before katana wielding samurai had become mainstream. Shogun 2 quickly became a fan favorite, but in my opinion, the best part of the game was that it gave birth to perhaps the best standalone expansion in the series, Fall of the Samurai. And when I tell you that Fall of the Samurai was a real game changer, I'm not kidding. I even made a separate review for it a few months back which you definitely should check out if you're interested. Now contrary to Rise of the Samurai, Fall of the Samurai takes us around 400 years into the future. This time, Japan is rapidly modernizing, pitting old traditions versus new technology against one another, and the same goes for the faction of the Shogun versus the faction supporting the Emperor. Many of the main mechanics from Shogun 2 remain, but now the battlefields are so much more diverse as it lets us take advantage of both old-style samurai warriors and light infantry and cannons, making for some truly epic scenes. On the naval battle side, massive warships are yet again at our disposal, offering some of the coolest battles in Total War history actually, and it makes it even more awesome that navies are actually useful as bombardment vessels on the campaign map and in field battles, if they're positioned in range. There's even trains now that can transport your troops from one location to the next, and a similar realm divide mechanic will make you the champion of your chosen alliance, offering you a change of faction symbol as well. Fall of the Samurai offered some of the best aspects of Total War in one and the same polished package, and continues to be one of my favorite Total War games of all time. They must be punished. Yeah. It was with a certain confidence then, that the Creative Assembly announced the release of a sequel to a fan favorite. In 2013, it was time to return to Rome, with Total War Rome 2. I remember watching the first trailers for this game, and you probably know which one I'm talking about. Yeah, that Siege of Carthage. Everything looking so darn polished and epic. But what we got was, well, let's just call it a very mixed bag. Because Rome 2 offered the largest campaign map by far in Total War history, with beautiful colors and great detail. And as a first in the series, Rome 2's towns and cities actually expanded when you built new districts really making it feel like your development had a real impact. The unit diversity was excellent, and with an extreme amount of factions, Rome 2's scale was beyond anything that had come before it. But sadly, Rome 2 was completely botched at launch. 
and I mean it was a complete dumpster fire. The performance was tragic, and so was the AI. The unit visuals were buggy, and there was neither a proper population mechanic, family tree, nor did the political system make much sense. Around the time of Rome 2, by the way, was the height of the cozy Total War weekly YouTube show Rally Point, where we got this timeless air candy handed to us. So in Rome 2, we have invested more resources into improving the battlefield AI than I think we have in any Total War game to date. Yeah, something clearly went wrong there. But with the Emperor Edition and several expansions releasing later on, including a Caesar DLC, an Augustus DLC, a Sparta DLC, and an Aurelian DLC, which frankly should have been a DLC for the next game, Rome 2 did get fixed, despite never really managing to live up to its full potential. And even though modders have done an absolutely wonderful job in making the Rome 2 that might have been, the game ended up being a massive letdown to a large portion of the fanbase, even though it remains one of the best-selling and most played Total War games of all time. I ride with a million warriors! I bring the end of days! I am the Scourge of God! And I will watch your world burn. But then, in the year 2015, Creative Assembly took a hard look at itself, and it must have been a really hard look at that, because we got Total War Attila. In my opinion, the best modern Total War game. Now, it might sound strange that Attila would turn out to be so great, but just listen to the synopsis of this bad boy that I just made up. The Roman Empire is collapsing, decadent, its rulers having grown fat, corrupt, and lazy. Unable to now fully control its outer borders and experiencing a divide between its older pagan followers and the rise of Christianity, the Western Roman Empire is on the brink of ruin. In the East, the much richer Eastern Roman Empire is thriving, yet also experiencing increased barbarian activity at its gates, even facing a rising Sassanid Empire ready to strike from the ancient sands of Persia. But there's more on the horizon, as the migrating barbarian hordes, and the strongest of them, the Huns, have Rome and Constantinople in their sights. That sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? Attila's premise is perfect for a Total War game. Like none other in the series, it's hardcore, having you deal with enemies and challenges from within and without, especially if you're testing your metal as the massive Romans. Thing is, in this game, size isn't everything. A new absolutely fantastic fertility mechanic determines how much food and revenue you get from farming, and a climate change mechanic makes everything more difficult, having your farms yield less and less crops as the decades pass on. We get a wonderfully grand return of the family tree, and arguably even the best implementation of the general and governor system, allowing us to place our generals in a tiered system depending on their skills, and having our governors enact edicts as long as they're in power. A general loyalty system is also in place, and even an army loyalty system is present, making for a tough as nails experience where you're always dealing with the contentment level of either your cities, armies, or generals. Attila offers the best horde mechanic in any Total War game, and even lets us put entire cities to the torch. Attila really just is the perfect package despite still not having a hot seat mode, proper general speeches, and the fact that it has some pretty poor performance on most computers, but as a game, it is almost unmatched among Total War games in complexity and difficulty. Attila received two expansion packs, one dealing with the Eastern Empire's reconquest of the West, and one moving forward to the early Middle Ages and Charlemagne, which was an amazing move as it managed to mix that feeling of the remnants of an old empire with a clear trajectory towards the medieval period most of us know and love. This action does not have my consent. In 2016, Total War changed forever. Only one year after Attila, Total War Warhammer was the first game in the series to actually break away from the tradition of historical Total War games and delve into the realm of fantasy, specifically the Warhammer franchise. Sporting an updated engine, Warhammer more importantly introduced magic, supernatural powers, and fantastical beasts and other units to the game, making for a completely different experience despite mechanically functioning in the same manner. 
In the campaign, factions were now given mechanics and functions specific to those factions, meaning that no two factions played the same, which really added to the sense of diversity and uniqueness. Warhammer was a grand success for CA, but it's no understatement that fans of the series were torn in their views. Many loved Warhammer, again for its faction and unit diversity, and for spicing up a formula which admittedly had become very samey. On the other hand, many others despised it for moving CA's focus on historical time periods away, and for being much too like other strategy games out there that focuses on fantasy rather than realism and maturity. This drama wouldn't stop CA from planning on making two other major titles and tons of DLC for the games, however, and the next game in the series came only one year after, in 2017, with Total War Warhammer 2. The sequel moved away from the old world and focused more on elves and lizards, bringing even more supernatural and magical elements than in the first game. There was basically more of everything in Warhammer 2, especially as it also allowed for gameplay on a campaign map combining the two games called the Mortal Empires campaign, which admittedly was very cool. Total War Warhammer 2 was another massive sales hit for CA, but like we touched upon, many historical fans now felt left behind after two whole years of no historical releases. This is when CA came up with the idea of Total War Saga games, a type of Total War games meant to focus on smaller wars or locations, but still offer substantial amounts of gameplay in historical settings. The thing is though, the Saga games have never really taken off as much as CA wanted. Now the first of these Total War Saga games was Total War Saga Thrones of Britannia, releasing in 2018, a game set in the early Viking Age and the British Isles. The game originally posed as a sort of hybrid between Total War and another franchise completely, Crusader Kings 2, since family members, court management, and events were supposed to count for a lot more. But sadly, Thrones of Britannia never came close to the complexity or fun of CK2, nor did it offer anything special in terms of classic Total War battles and campaigns. To many, the game felt like a cash grab and as a somewhat uninspired title meant to ride on the waves of both CK2 and Game of Thrones without really having its own identity. It even utilized Attila's outdated engine, for a reason I simply don't understand to this day. Another game came out in 2018, Total War Arena, which was meant to be an online game focusing on battles only between competing players. This game flopped completely though to say the least, at least in the West, as it currently stands, it's only available in China. Going back to the main titles now, Creative Assembly tried to make up for Thrones of Britannia with Three Kingdoms in 2019. Three Kingdoms moved Total War to a completely different place, namely China during the somewhat mythological time of the romance of the Three Kingdoms. As such, it became something of a mix between a historical and a fantasy title, as it was fully possible to have two generals fight each other to the death in a Naruto-style combat scene while your armies were standing by and doing other things. But the game had some nice innovations. The game engine was updated and highly polished, and the diplomacy system was completely changed for the better, giving us a system where we actually knew what was going on rather than vague positions. In addition, the general system was updated with a much deeper skill tree, and the battles felt like some of the most organic in the series in a very long time. It also added a cool day and night cycle for the campaign map. But to me personally, the Three Kingdoms had good foundations, but the Chinese setting never really captured me, and I felt like the Chinese geography contained too much land and too little diversity, never offering terrain that stood out or gave me a sense of change or different biomes. In addition, the user interface was all over the place, cluttering the screen which literally made the campaign map and the different text boxes just hard to look at. But maybe that's just me, as the game did very well for CA. What have you done? Another saga title came out a full year after Three Kingdoms in 2020, namely a Total War saga, Troy. And this is a special title, I do feel the need to say, because Troy is both so fantastic and so mediocre at the same time. Troy takes us back to the European theater, the first time since 2018 in fact, but does so in a very different way than before. Just like Three Kingdoms, Troy is a part historical, part mythological game, set over 1000 years BC during the Trojan Wars 
and on a localized map of ancient Greece and Western Anatolia. It's an absolutely stunning looking game, bringing the most beautiful campaign map to date, with gorgeous Greek terrain, oceans and a remarkable day and night cycle. My favorite thing about Troy though, is the fact that the factions are so darn unique, with each one demanding completely different playstyles. This uniqueness is even symbolized in the UI, which is so gosh darn perfect I can't believe this is a total war game and not a work of art. Actually, maybe it's both. In my opinion, Troy really managed to capture the vibe and aesthetic of super ancient Greece in the campaign. Sadly, I don't know if the same can be said for the battles, which is where things start to crack. The battles namely seem so arcadey compared to other Total War games, and even though the units might look time appropriate, I never really liked any of their designs except for a few. The battles aren't bad per se, just kind of mediocre and underwhelming, which obviously is a rather big deal when we're talking Total War. Another contentious aspect is that Troy released as a one year time exclusive on the Epic Game Store with a planned September 2021 release for Steam. This meant that fewer players bought the game than before, even though it was actually completely free on the Epic Store release date. Troy is the latest major Total War game to grace the computer screen, but early this year, players got a reunion with a classic in Total War, Rome Remastered. Rome Remastered is just that, a remastered version of the original Rome Total War, with updated graphics and an added merchant mechanic. Even though it was generally well received, like in my own review of the game, many players, including myself, were disappointed in both the horrible battle AI as well as the UI itself, which seemed more like a mobile interface than one made for PC. Rome Remastered was a welcome addition to the franchise though, but left many players hungry for more, like a Medieval 2 remaster or a revamp and upgraded version of Empire. In February of this year, CA announced Total War Warhammer 3, the last Warhammer game in the intended trilogy. Warhammer 3 is set to focus on the battle between the lands of the East and the realms of Chaos and is set to be the grand finale for the series with a planned release date later this year. And that was a complete history of Total War. But what of the future? Fans are clamoring for both a Medieval 3, Empire 2 and a Lord of the Rings Total War, but only time, license agreements and actually listening to the fans will tell what happens. For now though, the Creative Assembly's latest announcement has some players waiting for a new title set in China and the Romance of the Three Kingdoms era once more, while others still are awaiting more news of more, let's just say, familiar historical settings. The Total War series has come a long way, having now lasted over 20 years with a catalogue that should have something to offer for any fans of the genre out there. But this doesn't mean that it's without its faults, nor that the series has progressed in a linear fashion. From old glory days to pitfalls and mixed reception, Total War has remained one of the only series to truly utilize the concept of a combined campaign map with massive cinematic battles, and I for one hope this monopoly is challenged sooner rather than later. Thank you so much for watching friends, I know this was a long one, but I really wanted to cover the entirety of Total War history in one video, hopefully giving you a worthy and updated alternative to that GameSpot history video that came out almost 4 years ago now. If you're a Total War fan, what do you think of the series as it stands right now? And what are your hopes for the future? If you enjoyed the video, I sincerely hope you'll leave a like, a comment, subscribe to the channel and support me on Patreon. It would mean a whole lot. Thanks again and I'll see you next time. Cheers.